be a justice. Let me start over. Now we're recording. Okay, so I'm Brandon. I'm one of the organizers here at Media Justice. And as you heard, we wanted to have a call where you could hear from the campaigns team here at Media Justice, um, not just about kind of the work that we are doing, but kind of the, the, the line, the through line of kind of the past work we've been doing over the last year. We're gonna have a conversation with our executive director and a very special guest about kind of this moment. And then you're gonna hear from some of the folks that we've been working with over, that we're planning on doing more work with uh, in the coming years. Um, but to start off, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, the fun music, but I do have a little slideshow I made for you all. So I'm gonna share a little bit about where we've been. My screen share going. And let me just refresh to make sure that none of my pictures drop out. So this is my first time using Canva. None of my graphics or fonts were approved by our excellent communications team. So it's all my fault if this looks uh, amateurish. But anyways, so the campaign team in 2022. So at the beginning of 2022, this is what our team looked like. It was my Asia. Um, we had James and Emmett and then myself. But really early on in the beginning of 2022, right at the beginning of January, we had some amazing folks join our team. You can see Danny and Rumsha here. And you'll, you'll notice throughout the slideshow um, just how much of an impact they've had on the work here at Media Justice and, and how much they've hit the ground running. So sometimes what our work has looked like is uh, when we see cracks where we think with sharp analysis, we can maybe drive in and get some change to happen. And so sometimes it looks like trying to have interventions at federal agencies like the Federal Communications Commission. And so you can see the folks below the logos of some of the folks that we worked with to try to bring a reparations framework to this rulemaking process at the FCC um, as they're trying to think about how do they reconcile and deal with digital discrimination. I'm not going to read uh, all this, this text here, and there's going to be a lot of text, some of it I will read but I just want for folks to know that it just talks about all of the different places that we come from and all of the different communities that we're not speaking for, but who we're speaking with. Um, but this was not the only uh, um, federal agency where we saw an opportunity. So you see here also with uh, this huge group of folks that we work together with, and, and here I will read it. And so you can hear in Rumsha's own words, kind of why this felt like an important opportunity. So the Federal Trade Commission or FTC rulemaking process could be hugely consequential in finally reining in the tech abuses by police departments, private corporations, and federal government agencies. In the past two decades, without comprehensive government action to protect the public, the now massive industry profiting from the extraction of our personal information is operating largely with impunity it's high time to create rules that assert our rights and power in an environment where they are bought and sold, largely without the informed knowledge or consent, compounding exploitation of black and brown communities. But we also know at Media Justice that change and power does not come from the top. And so as we adjusted to this life with the COVID, we figured out when and how it was time to get back into the streets. And so you'll see here um, some of the actions and Danny really led on organizing a lot of these actions, bringing his community organizing and direct action experience, challenging Amazon and their power. And so you'll see here at an AWS summit here in DC, uh, you can see Danny here speaking and some of our, our friends. You'll also see here in New York where we were also protesting and challenging um, Amazon's power and the ways that they harm our communities. Smash bang. And you also see here, uh, there was also a wonderful banner drop at the MGM Casino here in DC. And so um, thanks a lot to what Danny's brought here, Media Justice. We've been able to make sure that we're not just trying to make interventions at the federal level, but also trying to work with people in direct action. Um, and we also wanna make sure that we're challenging dominant narratives. And so I've got a few clips here from where folks were featured in the press. And so this is Danny again, speaking with a mask on because even when we're out in the streets, we still wanna keep one another safe. All this complicity that Amazon has in state violence is unseen, but it's not unseen. It's not unseen because Danny is, is revealing that. 
here you'll see also our campaign director, My Asia, was in the press. Um, it's a little hard for me to see because I've got a lot of Zoom things in my screen, but you can see that the, the core of this message is that what Amazon's not talking about in these AWS summits is about the people that have been displaced, arrested and deported because of and with their technology. All they care about is trying to sanitize and, um, and sell more devices. And somehow even I managed to get in the press. And so here I am talking about uh, with the reporter about issues with the affordable connectivity program and internet subsidy. And what I wanted them to know is what they're seeing is not an issue with the federal subsidy program, ACP. It's an issue with the broadband economy overall. And that's because our large corporate providers, they just care about serving their shareholders. They don't care about serving the community members. And here's my age again, talking about uh, folks may have heard about Ring Nation, where they're trying to kind of turn the surveillance tech into America's funniest home video. And as my Asia says, this is making a mockery of the very real harms caused by Ring devices by essentially rebranding surveillance as entertainment. Again, so folks will buy more devices. We also responded to what was happening in the moment. And so when Roe v. Wade was overturned with the Dobbs decision, um, we worked with our partners, like folks at Mayfair. Some folks are on the call. And you can see here, this wasn't somewhere where we decided that me or our voices needed to be heard, but we needed to support those folks who've been doing this work for a long time. Um, but then there also were times when it did work to make sense. So this was part of a political education series that was hosted by our network team. And you can see that Rumsha joined folks from our network member Generation Justice to hold an intergenerational conversation about how public health and racialized disinformation are intersecting. And here again, Rumsha working with more folks to talk more about what does this mean? How do we think about using the internet and social media after this huge shift? Something else that we've done here at Media Justice is we've tried to bring together folks to create resources and um, research to help community members who are fighting these fights locally. And so I, I'm not gonna tell you about the Unshackling Freedom Project, thanks to our communications team and James, uh, we've got a great little clip and I'm gonna let James tell you about it himself. No sound on this, Brandon, unfortunately. I cannot hear anything. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Give me one second, because I do want you to hear what James has to say, and I'll reshare with audio. I do that every time. Okay. Let me try again. I'm so sorry. My window disappeared on me. Okay. So we're almost there, I promise. All right. All right. Resource. Let's try again. And case studies to gather data. Hi, it's James from Media Justice, and I'm really excited to announce the launch of our toolkit. Since 2017, our research and campaign experience has taught us that people on the ground need support to challenge the punitive technologies that are engulfing our communities. Our toolkit will provide people in communities with resources and case studies to gather data about electronic monitoring devices build strategies for engaging local authorities, and learn from other communities that have successfully resisted electronic monitoring and decarceration. Okay, sorry about that Hi. delay. But we also did other work with some other folks that are part of our network and our networks, including this report on the Department of Homeland Security and how they work with private corporations and big tech to bring the war on terror and surveillance into our neighborhoods. And this is not yet. You all are getting this sneak peek, but coming soon, Rumch has been working on this incredible propaganda project, which you'll hear more about. And also something that we did is that we, we really spent time working with young folks this year 
Um, so I worked with this group of students in Baltimore at SOMOS to help challenge Comcast when they were trying to challenge them during the pandemic. But over the summer, we also helped them to create media of their own to tell their own story. And so this is uh, photos from them filming a documentary that they created. And here's just a little clip from the intro. There is no audio here. These are just a few of the students. Not all of them were able to be there during shooting. There was a larger group that also helped support them to make this. And I'm almost done. So the last thing that I wanted to share was Rumsha also had a chance to talk with a group of young folks and they were so kind to send in kind of affirmations and love letters about that presentation that she gave. And so I just wanted to share some of those. So you see here, I really enjoy the way that you make learning, the learning space feel comfortable. Thank you for doing the closing activity of head, heart, and hand on the Jamboard. I enjoy how interactive this was from Isabel. From Mallory, Ms. Rumsha, I am so grateful to learn from you today. I enjoyed the way you let us utilize the chat because I am shy sometimes. Rumsha, thank you for this powerful presentation. It was so well made and helped me understand more about the bias we have in America from Jonathan. You made my learning experience very effective because I felt safe and comfortable with my camera off. I appreciate that you went deep into disinformation and gave examples. You were very comprehensive and easy to listen to from a J. And this is my last uh, one. I really wanted to end on this one. I felt empowered and I learned how to analyze disinformation and misinformation. Thank you so much, Ramcha, for a dynamic and informative presentation. I hope one day to work in a position similar to yours and your leadership for me to look up to is inspiring. And I wanted to end with that because if our campaign seem it had accomplished nothing else than planting that seed with Annie and not knowing what greatness will come from Annie and these other young folks who we've talked to and planted seeds with, if that was the only thing that we had done together over the last year, I would call that a success. But as you've seen, some of the other work we've done, we have done a lot more and so much more than I even got to do in the slideshow. And so that's kind of a little bit of our year in review. Couldn't fit in everything, but wanted to give a feel for what we've been doing. And this, this graphic in particular, comms team, I apologize for my graphics and fonts. We can talk after the call. Um, but now we want to talk about where we're going next and how we get to where we want to go together. The next part of the call, I'm going to pass it to our executive director, Stephen Renderos and our special guest, Alfredo, to talk a little bit about what they're seeing in this political moment. I don't have enough time to give them the kind of fullness of uh, introduction that they deserve, but I'll share that Stephen has been uh, with Media Justice now for almost 11 years and was a network member and a board member before that. And so he's been around for um, almost as long as Media Justice has existed. And Alfredo Lopez, who he's gonna be talking to, has also been a part and member of the Media Justice Network for a long time, someone who's been in the movement for over 50 years and someone who has been dealing with technology and figuring out how we should deal with technology in the movement for over 20 years. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it to you, Stephen and Alfredo to talk to us about what you're seeing in this moment. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for that trip down uh, memory lane, at least uh, in regards to this past year. Um, a lot has changed over a year. Uh, and uh, so I really appreciate getting to remember all the wonderful work that we've been a part of. Uh, it's also really heartening because um, a lot of the names and the people that I saw in the, in the flyers from the events that we did are folks that are newer to me. And, and I think that is one of the, the beautiful things about this work when you're movement building is you're constantly making space for the next generation and the next generation, um, if you're doing it well, right? Um, and, uh, and certainly I, I see that kind of, that lineage happening in this moment right now. So that's exciting. Um, I'm also really excited to take part in, in this conversation on the past, present, and future of media justice. Uh, it's I'm really fortunate that I get to do that in conversation with Alfredo Lopez, uh, a person I've known in this movement since I first joined, you know, media justice. Um, however, 
many years ago that was, probably 14, 15 years ago. Um, I'm pretty sure, Alfredo, the first time I met you, you were still working a Praxis project back then. That's how far back I think my memory extends with, with you. Um, so our task here, Alfredo, is to introduce this space, um, you know, to bring into this space at a high level some of the external conditions that are shaping the media justice landscape today. And um, I'm happy I get to do that with you because in many ways, it'll be giving people a peek into our relationship over the past decade. Uh, this conversation is pretty much the conversation you and I always have, wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely it is, uh, Stephen. And it's a, it's a, uh, ever uh rich and increasingly rich conversation to always be talking to you and then we talk now about uh, this every week and there's a, yeah. a, a you know a theme that comes out in that conversation constantly um which is that when you look at brandon's excellent uh slideshow and it was an excellent slideshow brandon has the tendency of putting himself down i've been at dealing with this for many years to encourage him to, you know, they, you, you got to see how good you are. Uh, and it was an excellent, uh, excellent presentation. You really gave you a good idea of what media justice does in so many aspects of its work and so much more. But there's a central theme to all of its work. And it's been there since there was a center for media justice, since uh, Malkia Cyril first founded this thing which was, and we'll just, I know we touch on it, probably touch on it a lot during the conversation, but I just want to touch on it very quickly. It's this whole idea. Every human being on earth has a story that is worth telling and listening to. It is a story replete with lessons for all of us. And it is an empowering story. Because when we tell our story, we are empowered. But when we tell our story, we empower those who are listening to us. They're beginning to understand that they are part of a group of people and they share a common experience. There is nothing more important right now in this struggle for a sustainable society, this revolutionary struggle, nothing more important than assuring and expanding upon the right everyone has to tell their own story as an individual in a group. That's what media justice has been doing all along. And so if you take the Brennan's slideshow, apply that to every single thing he showed, and you'll see how they have an inner logic uh, that is uh, that gives each of those struggles even more power than they already have. Anyway, I'll stop there, but, um, you know, it's great to be, that's the thing we're always talking about in one way or the that's other. Right. So I'm happy to be talking about it here. No, that's right. So let's, let's set some context then for this moment. Cause I, I think you're right. Like that was certainly the foundational uh, assumption that shaped media justice as a term, as a political framework uh, that eventually spawned into a network that engaged in movement building that eventually became a Oakland-based youth organization transforming into a national organization now called Media Justice. Um, and it certainly was the reason I got into this work, you know, was because of the power of needing to tell our own stories. Um, and as a young organizer, seeing the limitations of the, the culture that I was navigating and it really being a major impediment to accomplish the political wins that I thought was needed. So let's bring it to this moment then. Um, you know, when I've talked to you, I've heard you describe this period as a period of mass marginalization. You know, this idea that systems in our society, particularly under capitalism, by design, alienate, they, they extract from, and they oppress, you know, masses of everyday people. 
and media and technology as systems are no exception to that condition, right? Um, in fact, it's it's a tool that's being used to accelerate oppression. Um, you know, certainly you see this and you saw this in Brandon's slideshow in terms of where surveillance technology is focused. If you're some combination of poor, black, unhoused, incarcerated, disabled, um, you know, you're facing some of the harshest conditions when it comes to uh, to surveillance. Uh, you see this in how right wing media has taken to criminalizing drag shows, um, which is then leading to real world consequences, right? Threats, if not fully carried out acts of violence, uh, the introduction of anti LGBTQ legislation, um, like don't say gay bills. Uh, the truth is that anyone who is not part of the dominant culture or holds privilege relative to like race, class, and gender are under some form of attack. And I guess my question to you, Alfredo, is that as someone who has been a part of social movements for the better part of 50 plus years, uh, what's unique about this moment as it pertains to marginalization? I mean, I think that we are uh, in a moment of enormous empowerment and creativity on the part of the resistance. Um, now that has to be a nuanced explanation because there are uh, many problems that we face organizationally. But here's the thing. It, it, for most of my life, Stephen, when you envision the future, we envision the future that even if we were able to restructure the society, we'd have to do a lot of stuff to make ourselves capable of feeding and sustaining the population. The, the technology and capability wasn't there yet. But for the last 15, 20 years of my life, amazingly, I've realized we can do that with what we have. We have the ability to sustain the world and to sustain the human race. So what the hell's the problem? The problem, obviously, is the capitalist system, is the system that we have. That system to survive is marginalizing people over and over because it can't sustain them. You know, it can't mm. feed the whole human population. It can feed fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer people. The question that, you know, for a long time, people told us, well, there was a big struggle at the point of production. It's the point of consumption where there's a struggle because consumption is sustainability. How are you going to afford your own life? That's the issue everyone is facing right now. And with groups, particular groups of people, um, they're simply not able to do it. And so what the society is doing is it's marginalizing those people, making them into subhumans. And that it does it over and over again. And you see that's what's happening right now is the, the frame that they're, um, they're uh, using to describe people is an, an, a subhuman frame. When you're talking about all of the questions of, for example, uh, people, uh, LGBTQ, gender nonconforming people, uh, trans people, all, all those types of people, this is a major development in the society that these people are able to seize themselves and their own lives and seize control of those things. It's a revolutionary act. So one of the things you got to do if you want to sustain the society is smash those people. You can't have a bunch of people expressing themselves personally and putting their whole life out there personally in a society that doesn't allow that. That, and, you know, once you do that, once you're able to say, I am this person, I am a person who's worth it. I am a person of self-worth. That's a revolutionary act because the society is not treating you that way. So we have more mm -hmm. and more of that. That's the struggle that we have right now. One of the things fascism does is it tries to convince people that most people that you know aren't really human. Mm. That's what it wants to tell you. And so, you know, we say this over and over, 
you know, in, in it's almost become rhetorical, but th just think about this for a second. Uh, can you really um, view, for example, let's take black people in the United States. Can you view these people, uh, black people in that sense, without incorporating the history of Africa? Yeah, can you do it? But once you incorporate that history, think about what it does to the history of the United States. The story of this country is totally changed and transformed. So you mm. see all of those attacks on personality, on, on, uh, on uh, per personal expression, on lifestyle, on personal choices, on the ability to sustain people, to sustain themselves. <clears throat> you know, uh, um, one of my sons, my younger son, who's a PhD candidate, is always posing the question of why we have so many people in, in, in prison. W what the hell kind of society is it where so many people are thrown behind bars? Well, that's part of the marginalization. It's simple. Well, let me, let me yeah. expand. Yeah, go ahead. Let, let me expand on this theme of marginalization because it's what you're describing is it's, it's happening. And I think one of the things I wanted to hone in on is how it's happening, right? Uh, in Florida, and speaking of your younger son, Lucas, um, Lucas, who lives down in Florida, you know, we've seen the most prominent attack on, you know, critical race theory, quote unquote. Um, and it took shape in, in the form of a bill that was recently signed into law by Governor Ron DeSantis, which the quick and dirty for folks who are unfamiliar is that it bans the teaching of certain topics related to race. Uh, and advanced teachers from making students feel shame about their race, right? Uh, now I know Lucas, uh, who's down at a school in Florida, is already seeing some of the effects of this law yeah. take shape. I'm curious if you could share more about that, but more pointedly, where does this fight around critical race theory fit in to, to, to being a media justice fight within this kind of context of marginalization? Yeah. So the um that marginalization, you know, one of the things that it gives way to is fascism. That's one of the responses that this system has to that stuff is fascism. Uh, in Florida, DeSantis is a fascist. And, you know, I know some people consider it impolite to use the word. That's what he is. That's the politics that you see. And uh, fascism's primary thrust is to make sure that you can't educate to people's real history. You see them trying to chop off different stuff. I mean, critical race theory is not what they're attacking. They, they gave a name to say critical race theory, but that's not what the attack is. The attack is on the teaching of Black history and the history of the United States. So, I mean, you say my son, Lucas, my son, you know, is a, a president of a graduate uh, students Association of Sociology and Social Study, and they do these conferences. And already the selection of speakers, he's getting pressure about who he could select for speakers and all this type of thing, because they don't want in Florida particular kinds of history taught. Now, what does that mean? It's the same thing going back to telling your own story, right? Um, the teaching of history of, for example, people of color, various people of color, whatever you want to say, and labor movements, for example, et cetera, that teaching of history is the institu institutionalization of us telling our own story. It's the same thing. And once they can take that away from us, they have control of the society. That's what they're attacking mm -hmm. because they realize that's where the danger is to them. They understand, we may not understand, all of us, how revolutionary telling our own story is. The fascists understand. And one mm. of the things I've learned in the 56 years I've been struggling is, if you want to find out what's important about your politics, listen to what the fascists are responding to. See? So, I mean, all of that. Now, I, mm. I did want to say really briefly and quickly one thing, <clears throat> Stephen, that's very, very important here, which is that there is this thirst for communication that we've seen through the technology, the internet, et cetera, et cetera, um, that I do think 
represents an enormous pushback. I know uh, internet is one of the things you like to talk about a lot. I mean, I do. I do <laughs> well, can, can I can I ask you my question before yeah, you before sure. I jump in? Yeah, sure. So, because we've got we've got about three four minutes, and I've got two questions to to throw at you, right? And since you got on the topic of fascists, let's talk about that. Makes me think of Elon Musk and Twitter, right? Yeah. And one of one of the things that's come up since the sale of Twitter to Elon Musk um, has been this conversation I've had with many different sets of people about is this tool dead? You know, I've, I literally as a black feminist I follow on Twitter who who tweeted that the other day. I've been a part of funeral conversations over Twitter and and you know lamenting the loss of this tool to a fascist and someone who is you know, intentionally taken that tool to the right. Um, and I think part of what is behind that sentiment is, is feeling the loss of a period of the internet that spawned an online conversation called Black Lives Matter that became, you know, an offline movement in real life. The, the emergence of Arab Spring, the mobilization of progressive activism through platforms like change.org and move on. Um, there's, you know, a nostalgia for what this kind of, this phase of the internet that some people call web 2.0 um, has been and seeing that, you know, kind of the final nail in the coffin, so to mm. speak. So I guess, you know, you've always been, we've talked about the internet a lot. You're a very hopeful thinker when it comes to the internet. And I point people to an essay that you wrote way back in 2007 called The Organic Internet. Um, and the argument you made there is that the internet is the largest human network in the history of the world. Yeah. Um, and you kind of invite us to think about the internet, not so much as a technology, but as a social movement in and of itself. So I guess with 2023, you know, glasses on, have we lost that, that battle for the internet? Because you were about to get into how this presents an opportunity, but I'm curious your perspective. My perspective is we are the internet. So if we lost the internet, we've lost ourselves. Um, there are 5 billion people on that thing. Um, and it, it is ever more a central part of people's lives and the communication people carry on. So what you're seeing on the internet effectively is the different uh, components of, of population, different groups of people who are struggling against each other, the right, the left, and everything. When people say, we've lost the internet, the right controls it, or whatever, or what you're saying, Stephen, with about the nostalgia for Black lives, look at the internet, man. Just look at it. Take a look at it. You tell me what movement organization is not on the internet. Mm. And in fact, we have this whole new phenomenon of organizations, massive organizations of the left of the movement who are exclusively on the internet and working and, 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 and using it. The problem is who controls it and how it's controlled. If we could, there are ways of doing it technologically. We could, we can at this point, that's what I was talking about when you have, so we have the technology in hand. We have the technology in hand to decentralize the internet now. We can do it. It's an organizational problem. And, you know, mm. that's uh, one we can discuss. But that's the importance of things like media justice, you know. And, and uh, you know, when are we going to put together the kind of coalition and network necessary to start organizing uh, that usage of the internet and that approach? Because right now, with 5 billion people on the internet, we have everything we need to move forward. <laughs> Nobody can stop us. What are they going to do? Mm. They can't stop us. We use it all the time. So do I think the internet's... Absolutely not. I debate that. I, 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 uh, I differ with that respectfully and profoundly. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> we just got started. This is just getting started, man. With 5 billion, this is a dream come true, you know? <laughs> I appreciate that. And I guess I would say that the, the the significant opportunity that's emerging is a lot of the conversations that are moving towards Web 3.0, the yep. 
a decentralized version of the internet that decentralizes not just the platforms that we navigate or the apps, but also the infrastructure that that we enter to get to the internet. Um, and I think I appreciate naming like, you know, our place in that as an organization and as a network, because we are sitting in some uncertainty right now, but it's some uncertainty that we're trying to move through and, and try to trying to figure out. Um, you know, we're going through strategic planning right now, and you're you're helping us out in that process. And this conversation here is helping us out in that process because it's uh, in order to figure out what responsibility we should be taking over. Um, you know, it's it's not something. It's not a place where we can land and answer a solution on our on our own. Um, I know we've got to wrap up. So here's what I'll say. Um, uh, folks should check out, folks should connect with Alfredo for many reasons, but one of the things that you're working on right now is also organizing radical elders uh, uh, and trying to kind of build stronger bridges between generations of social movements, which um, I had a question in here about, you know, what we're missing and in, in, in the lack of those connections, but we don't have time for it, but folks should follow up with you on it because you're you're constantly trying to bring, you know, voices, intergenerational voices to be engaging with that cohort of people that you're organizing. Um, but uh, but the last thing I wanted to say is uh, there's actually a, a poem that um, I really love. It's written by uh, a Korean labor uh, activist named Park Nohe. Uh, the poem's called Again. Um, and I, I won't read the whole poem, but there's a line in it that says, in truly good people is already a good world. Uh, and one of the gifts of being a part of the media justice movement is getting to experience that good world through good people like you, Alfredo. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, speaking of good people, we've got other voices we're trying to invite into this conversation here today. So let me let me thank you, Alfredo, for being a part of this with me. Mm -hmm. um, and let me pass it back to DJ Ome, who's going to kick some tunes as we prepare for the next segment. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alfredo. That was deep, y'all. I was like sucked into that conversation and totally forgot I was DJing. All right, y'all. I want you all to get up out of your seat because I think we need a moment to get up out of your seat. I'm going to ask you this really quick question. Turn on your screens for me. I want to know who's on here. Turn on your screens for me. Ah, I see Jack. I see. Uh, oh, yeah. I see people. DJ, where you at? Rumsha. I see my beautiful people out there. Okay, this is what I want you to do, Akina. This is what I want you to do, Vanessa. I want you to find something in your house that makes you think of the future of MJ, the future, and bring it back to the screen. Something in your house that about the future, the future. I want you to show us, Frankie, think about it. Something that makes Nails, you think hair, of the future heels, face, done, of MJ. Lips, real, Brandon's got something bill. cute. Yes, Brandon's a got a legs, legs, digital face, eyes, gaming face, device, face, it looks face, like. Face, Vanessa, what do you got? Me, what do you got, wish, Vanessa? M&M's remind you of the future. Steven says meme wars. It's a book. Come on, Brandon. Hey, Akina, find something that reminds you of MJ and the future. Future. I strut, strut, Nadia, strut, MJ in the future. I don't work for free. Sarah, where you That's at? The tea. Ames. So make it rain on me. What makes you think of the future of MJ? What you gonna let them see? My nails, hair, hips, heels, nails, hair. I kind of see it. Oh, that's a, is that a clock? Like a timer? Yes, time. All right, Maisha. Viral justice. All right. Keep moving with me, y'all. Get about your seats for this next minute. Come on, move. Akina, come on, dance with me. Who's going to dance with me? Spotlight my people, Jack. Spotlight my people. One says left, right, left, right, left with a spin. Hey, hey, I'm so fab, I'm going with the wind. Come on, Janice. Work it, girl. Work it. I don't dance, I work. Work, Steven. Where you at, Daniela? Sashay away. Come on, Nadia, Sashay. So make it rain on me, and I might let you see. My nails, head, hips, heels. Work, 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 work. Brandon, work. Room show work, room show work, Danny work, 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 Brandon work, Vanessa work. Nails, hair, 
hips, heels, nails, hair, hips, heels. Okay, dolls, y'all know what time it is. Come on. Everybody on the floor. Everybody on the floor. Now I want you to stretch out those arms, stretch out those legs. Stretch, stretch them out. out. Stretch out that Come on, Miriam. I don't want to see you dance. I want Come to on, see TJ. you work. Come on, drop for me, drop for me, drop, drop for me, drop for me. Drop Work it, y'all. Work it, Danny. Drop for me, drop for me, drop for me. 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 Come on, Vanessa. One more minute. One more minute. Watch out, I kill it. Watch out, I spit it on the mic. Fill it. Y'all can't do it. Just admit it. We got furry, furry creatures in the house. My big bit is bopping like this. Look pretty. Y'all let's go. No, I didn't did it. Cause I'm marvelous, fantabulous. A bad chick. The flow sick like old shit. You know, come on. Shut up that energy, Janice. Let's go. Raisha Teresa. You get in there, huh, Teresa? My beautiful people, approach your day with gratitude for yourself and others. You are a gift. Life is a gift. Be open and understand that every day has many possibilities and every moment is precious. Every experience is meaningful and serves its purpose. Thank you for being here. Thank you for moving with me. Now we're going to pass it on over to Danny and Ramsha to talk about how we'll move into the future together. Give them a hand, y'all. Give them a hand. Come on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bueno, me okay, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much for being present here this afternoon. We are very excited to have this space as a campaign team in media justice and this space to, to be able to reflect, to be able to take some time as a community, and also to imagine a bit more of where we're headed. And that's why we are so happy to have this conversation as a group. Uh, uh, we have some folks here that represent organizations and as part of the net, uh, media just a larger media justice network and so we know that it's going to be a very excellent conversation so i'm gonna i'm not gonna take more time i am gonna ask folks who are going to participate in the conversation if they could briefly introduce themselves saying your name the organization in less than a minute please and then we'll pass on to the questions that the first one is going to be a bit of what has got your attention during your time working with media justice? So I'll pass it to Carla. I don't think we can hear you. I think maybe you're on mute. Pasamos con alguien más de la grupo si se pueden presentar. I will pass on so that folks in the group can present themselves. Frankie, are you there? Are you passing it to me? Melata. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Frankie. I use they and them pronouns. Um, I am coming to you from Uekma Ohlone Lands, um, also known as San Jose, California. Um, I work for Creative San Jose as the education and community manager. Um, Creative San Jose is the community access center for San Jose. For folks who don't know about um, what a community access center or public television center is, um, it is essentially a place where the community can come to learn how to make media and also get their media um, on cable channels. Um, public access has a really interesting and unique history 
um, which I'll touch on just a little bit, uh, where um, because cable, con cable companies were running their infrastructure through public lands, activists got together to say, hey, like since you are profiting off public lands, um, the community deserves to um, get some kickback from that to be able to use the channels. So um, what our work is, is kind of continuing that kernel of um, helping folks get access to media um, and the tools to create media um, within this kind of like media hegemony um, of the media landscape that is dominated by only certain media companies. So that's our mission. And we are specifically, uh, or one of, we're specifically focused around equity. So um, specifically working with communities have, that have historically been systemically excluded um, from the media landscape. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you and also to have had the opportunity to dance with you all too. Yes, I can go next since Danny called on us simultaneously. Um, my name is Aki or Akina or Akina. Um, I work for the University of California, Los Angeles Center on Race and Digital Justice. Um, and technically, since we're at an academic institution, that means that we are essentially like a research center. Um, our mission in particular, though, is to strengthen the community of people who are working at the intersection of data, technology, power, and racial justice. So th those are folks like everyone on this call <laughs> um, and everyone in the Media Justice Network. Um, and I say we're not a traditional research center because in my experience and opinion, a lot of research centers tend to be directed to doing research for other academics or research for political officials or research for people who hold what we might call like traditional forms of power. But we at the Center on Race and Digital Justice are really focused on how do we support and uplift campaigns and coalitions that are working with folks on the ground, working with folks in your neighborhood, in your community. Um, and so uh, recently our work with Media Justice has like in some ways been aligned, in some ways not been aligned with that, in that uh, you probably saw our name in Brandon's slide for letters to the FTC and the FCC, which are both federal agencies. But as we were writing that with uh, Media Justice and other folks on the call, the real focus of how we wrote that and how we talked about that was like, how do we strengthen this community? Who do we name in those letters? Like, how do we articulate this in a way that will build up the community and expand the community and if someone who wasn't uh, a politician or academic picked up this letter out of nowhere, would they get it? Would they want to be with us? So that's a little bit about us. And I guess I'll pass it to Janice next. Thanks, Aki. I'm Janice. Um, I work with the Detroit Community Technology Project on the Equitable Internet Initiative. Um, we call it DCTP for short. Um, our focus is really on community technology education, um, which includes um, everything from digital stewardship to data justice, which includes um, digital security, privacy, and consent. Um, through the Equitable Internet Initiative, we incubate and resource um, neighborhood ISPs, and we also train residents um, to be digital stewards so that they can then organize their communities and then build um, community wireless networks. Um, our work is really rooted in the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition principles um, that focus on access, participation, um, healthy communities, and ownership. Um, it's also guided by a set of um, equitable internet initiative principles that really guide how we work and who we work with. Um, in my specific role, I work with our community partners um, to support them with um, implementing the program within their neighborhoods. Um, we work on expansion, um, workforce development, uh, resiliency, and sustainability. Um, now pass it to pass it to Ramsha. Sure, I can introduce myself. Hi everyone, my name is Ramsha. I'm an organizer with Media Justice 
And I believe we have one more panelist. Uh, Carla, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Carla Rabondo. I'm the director for Pueblos de Lucha en Esperanza. We're a nonprofit organization in Minnesota, and I'll be speaking both Spanish and English. So folks just really want to make sure that uh, they're on the English one or the Spanish one. Um, pero nuestra misión es desmantelar los sistemas y estructuras. And our mission is dismantle the system and structure that uh, oppress immigrant people through education part and then the resources to the Latino community in their uh, hope and struggle for liberation. Organizations and churches uh, to organize with, within the community around concerns with housing in um, multifamily buildings to manufactured housing or mobile homes. Um, we also do a lot of work around public transportation, specifically the Blue Line train that's going to be running here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, we do a lot of leadership development and our most recent campaign that we're really excited to partner with Media Justice is in electronic monitoring. And unfortunately, our staff, Milky, who's the organizer in charge of this project couldn't be here, but we're really excited to get that going and really use this component of storytelling um, with our community members and share that struggle and what we hope to accomplish with these narratives. Thank you all so much for sharing a bit about yourself and your organization. Um, to start us off, uh, I wanted to ask, what has been a highlight of your work with media justice? Um, I can hop in and uh, answer that question first. Um, so I've been working uh, with media justice, specifically with Ramsha and Ramsha's team uh, around helping to create a curriculum around debunking disinformation, around narratives about policing and propaganda. Um, and what has been just really, really like refreshing about working with media justice is um, just how thoughtful the containers of time and the working containers are that, that y'all create. Um, I feel like I've always felt like my time is super respected. Um, everything feels really, really clear about like what's expected. Um, I feel like I'm able to bring my like whole human self to working. Um, and then just also being able to work with uh, such an incredible team of people. Um, it's just really, really cool coming from a nonprofit background. You know, you wear so many different hats and it's just so like uh, really, really refreshing to work on um, such an expansive team. Um, so that's what I've really appreciated and that we're all doing this work um, essentially to try to make our our world better for our community. So that's what I've really enjoyed about working with media justice. And I can share um, what I really appreciate is um, much like Frankie said, just like how you all create and hold spaces where we're you know able to um, connect with each other and, you know, working with similar orgs and other, you know, organizers doing similar work, um, just the conversations that you all hold space for, like, whether it's about, you know, organizing against Comcast, talking about FCC and digital discrimination um, and affordable internet. Um, I also just really appreciate just you all lifting our name up, as well as the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition principles. Um, you know, we love replication of our work, but, you know, we're an organization that has experienced a lot of extraction. Um, so just that lifting up our name in spaces really means a lot to us. Yes, we are your number one fans. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brandon, for saying that in the chat. Um, we're a big fan of the work of all the panelists on the call today, which is why it's such an honor to have you speak with us. Um, I would love to ask you another question around, you know, media justice covers so many different issues. And I'm curious on how you think those issues intersect. So internet rights, electronic monitoring, fighting Amazon, surveillance, policing, disinformation. How do you think these different issues we work on intersect?
And uh, Janice, would you be willing to start us off? Yep. Um, so I just want to speak about it, like from what I'm seeing here um, in Detroit. Um, you know, we're majority Black city, prob I think probably the only majority Black city um, left in the country. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, like a lot of what we do is data justice. Um, you know, a large piece of that is educating our communities and, you know, digital security, privacy, and consent. Now, what I'm seeing in Detroit is like under this um, guise of affordable internet access and, of course, you know, trying to reduce crime is that you have like ISPs and other organizations like shouting from everywhere that they're focused now on digital inclusion and access. Um, but what it really feels like is that they're just finding more and more ways to collect our data and bring in, you know, and pilot more surveillance technology here. Um, so one quick example I'll share is that the city of Detroit wants to build this open access um, fiber network, um, you know, because the infrastructure here hasn't been updated in decades. And that sounds great in theory to do that, but imagine a city that is so heavily invested in surveillance, owning your broadband infrastructure and the implications of that. Um, so sure, it's something we would love to build on, but the major you know, issue there is data collection. Like who's collecting it, who's managing it, how is it going to be used? So, you know, that's something that we're, you know, having um to weigh and like what would privacy look like in a situation on an open access network like that in a city, you know, where they're piloting surveillance technologies um, every day? Like, how can you really be sure that you're communicating safely and privately? So that's, I mean, that's for me the biggest way I see um, the intersection. Um, I think for me, like kind of what I see um, across everybody's work is just a like really like optimistic practice in a way of like believing that um, humans can make change and can make change that are supportive to our community. So, you know, whether that be you're working in Internet access or um, working to um stop like unethical uh, data surveillance or working in providing um, like reducing barriers to access for um, media making technologies and skills like what I think kind of all of the different projects that um, we share is at the core of them this belief that we can make change and that like our communities have the skills and the knowledge and the technologies to make that change and when we work together, um, we can make the world into a more sustainable, like loving, um, life supporting place. So that's just one thing that I see across all of the different projects. Um, Aki, I'm curious to hear your thoughts if you uh, have any on how they're all connected. Yeah, I mean, I think that was really great to bring up to Frankie that optimistic side, because I think. I oftentimes am like, it's the pessimistic stuff. <laughs> it's the harms and the terrible things that combine all of our work. But I think it's like the fact that hope and optimism is our only way out of the complete like digital resignation or like giving up everything to the momentum and inertia of our digital lives becoming like more controlled by fewer and fewer people and therefore our real and physical lives also being controlled by more fewer and fewer people and i think what comes to mind for me is that what connects a lot of our work is that we are challenging these things that have been presented as easy technical solutions like all this technical tinkering around the outsides like Carla's work on electronic monitoring is like a tinkering to the incarceration system. Um, and the work that you brought up, Janice, is like a tinkering to internet access is what if we combine it with surveillance in the city? 
um, but they're not ever actually getting at any of the root causes. And that in a way requires a deep optimism that tackling the root cause is worth it and that you can get success and like we can go to a better place in a better world. So I think you mentioning that optimism actually like helped me clarify that those are really interconnected. The realization of both like historic, present, and unfortunately probably future harm. And the only way to overcome that is with that hope and optimism. Yeah, I put in the chat that it does seem like it's funny that like it seems kind of pessimistic on the outside, but like inside there's this like glittering jewel of like hope and optimism that like like even though we're like, oh, we can see like how um like oppressive the structures are and the ways that um you know like large corporations like in collusion with the government like try to take advantage of of these systems like we still have this like shared hope underneath like even though we're like oh that's so messed up there's still this shared hope underneath it that we're like and we know that our communities like deserve better and we could do it together like I think that that is just kind of like a really cool thread that stitches all the work together Thank you all so much for speaking on those different pieces and how they intersect and like what the role of like hope and pessimism are in our movements. Um, I want to make space for Carla to to jump into um, as we wrap up our fishbowl. I want to make sure we we hear from you if you're there. Um, please let us know like what are your thoughts on the general conversation or how you see this work intersecting um, across issues. Hi, oh, yeah. Um, so in terms of the work intersecting, I'm really, and this kind of ties into, sorry if I'm skip, skipping to one of the questions of um, what I'm excited and curious. Um, I know with this work that we're starting with storytelling, it, it we're really excited to see like people are impacted by everything and have concerns from housing to driving to the immigration status. And for us, we really work with the immigrant community. Um, and in Minnesota, we were fortunate enough to actually pass driver's license for all bill. Actually today, like the governor just signed it today. So we're really excited that that's one burden off the community now that they can drive freely without having that fear of getting stopped um, by the police or their children in the back seat. So now that this driving to work, driving to school is not of a concern, now they can worry more about like, well, now for housing, for work, but there's this whole idea of like, well, some folks are being monitored. Well, now that this pathway of like driver's license for all pass, well, what can we do? What bill, what policy can we start having conversations on that we could actually pass in the state, in the whole country. Like, I think that's what's exciting for us to start this project, because we know we want to address this issue. We know it impacts a lot of our base. Now we're we're excited to be in the space with Media Justice and others that have done this work to, to try and figure out, okay, well, what can we do to address? What, what can we dismantle now that we've opened a pathway for folks to drive safely without having to fear the police, without having to be stopped. So how, how can we now move from driving to housing to immigration status? Like if this was possible here in the States, like we're just imagining like what, what bigger policy can we pass now? Awesome, thank you. Un momento, perdón. Eh, muchísimas Just one second, thank you so much. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's. Lito. A ver. Okay, me oyen? Can you hear me? Okay, okay good. 
Great, let's wait this way. So then, again, thank you so much for sharing with us in this space with us, Janice, Carla, Aki, and Frankie. Um, and thank you also. We know that this is only a part of the representation of the movement for justice in media that is being led by communities that are directly affected uh, by all of these topics, which are very complex and that affect us all in different ways. But we know that they're very connected. And that's why I think this is a power of our network, of our organization, and the organ and your organizations. There's, there's a struggle that's directed by the people, and that's how we're going to achieve liberation in a digital era. So thank you so much again. Um, now we're going to take some time. I want to recognize that we have gotten to the end of our time together that right now our compass uh, and the, the, the access teams might have to dis disconnect. So if that's going to happen, no problem. We want to recognize also the time that we had committed to. And now we're going to pass directly to our friend Ramsha and share, uh, as you know, we've communicated we communicate in many forms, whether that be through text, language, audio, uh, maybe physical, visual language. So today we are excited that we have music, we have conversation, and we also have a visual thing, a visual aspect, which is a review of the, today's discussion through art. Now we'll pass it to Ramsha and Sara, who is going to share their screen. Thank you, Danny. This is Ramsha speaking. Um, I am going to pass to Sarah. Are you uh, comfortable and ready to screen share? Perfect. And thank you, DJ Omi, for the music during this section. sharing your work with us today. Gorgeous as always. Um, and thank you, DJ Ome, for the tunes while we uh, while we shared. Thank you. 
Uh, so I'm going to close this out on how you can get involved with our work. Um, Danny, are you going to be uh, doing uh, interpretation as I'm? OK, perfect. I'll give you space to do that, too. OK, perfect. So I'm going to uh, share with you all our ways to get involved. Um, and I believe we have um, a resource guide that we wanted to share with folks on different ways you can get um, get in touch with us and attend a disinformation training on propaganda in the coming months. Uh, look out for a release of that propaganda training um, and, and, that, and that curriculum. Um, if you want to organize in your community around electronic monitoring, we have trainings coming up in the next few months for that as well. Um, and if you want to organize to make sure that your community is reflected in state planning for federal internet dollars, uh, reach out to Brandon, who's our, our resident internet organizer, who can hook you up. Um, and I will pass to DJ Omi to close us out. Thank you, Ramsha. Thank you very much, all y'all, for being here with us. Let today be full of new intentions, new light, goals, and new focus. Dream your dreams, stay true to yourself, and ultimately, just have faith, y'all. Thank you for joining the State of Media Justice and for being our community. You can keep up with our campaigns, teams, work by using the resource guide for reach out to one of our organi organizers on how to get involved with our work. Thank you very much for being here. Yes. You know what? I want to do something before we go. It's a, it's called a chat shower. It's called a chat shower. I want you to type something in the in the chat without sending it yet. Actually, I want you to type something that you're thinking about affirmations that you're sending to MJ for the future. Affirmations for the future. Do not send it yet. Do not send it yet. When I say go, then you're going to send it. Okay? Actually, when I say si se puede, then you're going to send it. All right? All right. Everybody got their, their text in that chat? Everybody got it? When I say si se puede, I want you guys to just click that button and we're going to see a beautiful chat shower. All right? Ready, set? Si se puede. Si se puede. Yes. Si se puede. We are worthy. People power. Tell your story. Community care. The internet is us. Who's going to stop us? Media justice has created such a powerful, beautiful network. We are in this together. We are the internet. Alfredo said. Community power. Fulfilling collaborations. I'm just so grateful to be in this work with all of y'all, Brian said. Thank y'all for coming and being here with us. Y'all have a beautiful rest your day dj janice nadia thank you bye bye to the non-believers, vagabonds and heathens, achievers we ain't satisfied with dreaming long as i'm still breathing watch how i move See you later, y'all. Have a beautiful rest of your day. The whole world our path. Nadia, give thanks to the simple things in life, y'all. Waking up, breathing, and being alive. That hot shower, going to work, eating, walking, seeing the beautiful world around you. It is the simple things we take for granted. Do not take them for granted. Have a good meal tonight, y'all, if you haven't eaten already. And drink some good water, too. Bye-bye!